In this video, we start our new chapter on the longitudinal dynamics of a vehicle. In this first part, we'll look at the acceleration and deceleration of the vehicle via its powertrain and brakes. In the following videos, we'll then look at the resistive forces acting on the vehicle and also the control of the longitudinal dynamics of the vehicle. Let's begin with an overview of a standard powertrain. The powertrain comprises all main components of a vehicle that generate power and deliver that power to the road surface. As shown in this picture, the main elements of the powertrain are the engine, the drivetrain and the driven wheels. The drivetrain itself contains the following main components. First, the clutch in case of a manual transmission or the torque converter in the case of an automatic transmission, whose purpose is obviously to provide the ability to decouple the engine from the rest of the drivetrain. Second, the gearbox, which contains the manual or automatic transmission, whose purpose is to match the engine speed to the actual road speed. Third, the drive shaft. Fourth, the differential, which actually has two purposes. One is to redirect the power flow by 90 degrees. And the other one is that it allows for one of the wheels to turn faster than the other one. And fifth, the axle shafts, which are connected to and transmit the power to the wheels. Next, we'll go on by looking at each of these components in a little more detail. In this video, we'll start with looking at the engine and the brakes, which are connected to the wheels. And in the next video, we'll then look at the different components of the drivetrain. So let's begin with looking at the engine. The main purpose of the engine is, of course, to deliver power to the vehicle. As you certainly know from your basic mechanics class, power is defined as the inner product of a force with the velocity vector, or in other words, the component of the force that points in the direction of the velocity times the velocity. Given this formula for the translatory motion, there is of course an equivalent for the power in case of a rotatory motion. Here, the power is given as the inner product of the vector of the torque with the vector of the angular speed. And if both share the same direction, this simplifies to the scalar product of the torque times the angular speed. The main types of automotive engines are, for one, combustion engines, which use as an energy source different types of fuel, in particular gasoline, diesel or liquefied petroleum gas. And second, electric motors, which can be based on different types of energy sources, in particular batteries, fuel cells or overhead wires. However, overhead wires are more popular for urban buses and sometimes trucks rather than passenger vehicles. And third, hybrid powertrains, which involve at least two different energy sources, where the idea is obviously to combine the different advantages. Usually, of course, a combustion engine is combined with an electric motor so that, for instance, the electric motor can be used at low speeds to accelerate the vehicle and it can also be used as a generator to recuperate the kinetic energy when the vehicle is braking. Or finally, the combustion engine can be used to power an electric generator so that the combustion engine can permanently run under stationary conditions which are close to the optimal operating point of the combustion engine. 
This automatically brings us to the question of the main performance criteria for automotive engines. For one, we may look at the peak performance criteria of the engine, such as peak power measured in horsepowers or kilowatts, or the peak torque of the engine measured in newton meters. More informative, however, is the full motor characteristic, which is the curve that provides the power or torque over the engine speed, which is measured in rotations per minute or RPM. Here we see two examples of motor characteristics for a fictitious gasoline engine and a fictitious diesel engine. For both engines, we see the respective power curve in red and the respective torque curve in blue, always plotted over the engine speed. The peak power of the gasoline engine is represented by the point P star and it amounts to approximately 100 kilowatts and the peak torques are given by the points M star for both engines. The peak power for the diesel engine is actually not visible from this diagram. Of course, there's a close relationship between the power of the engine and the torque as we have seen on the previous page, namely the power equals to the torque times the engine speed. In practice, when we perform this multiplication, we always have to pay a little bit of attention to the units being used. There are no issues if we stick to the standard metric units, meaning kilowatts for the power, which equals to 1000 newton meters per second, newton meters for the torque and radians per second for the engine speed. However, in the automotive field, there are many different units being used, which cannot all be listed here. So we only choose the most popular ones. Very popular is the use of horsepowers for the power of an engine, where one kilowatt amounts to approximately 1.34 horsepowers. And it's also very popular to use rotations per minute for the engine speed. And one radian per second amounts to pi over 30 rotations per minute. One additional remark to keep in mind when you look at these curves is that they represent the full load power scenario of the engine or colloquially speaking, the full throttle scenario. Another very important performance criterion for an engine is its power efficiency. It is defined as the fraction between the mechanical power that the engine produces and the power that the engine consumes in terms of chemical energy of the fuel, for example, or electrical energy. For combustion engines, power efficiency is usually expressed by specific fuel consumption, which is measured by kilograms of fuel consumed per kilowatt hour of energy produced by the engine. When we compare the specific fuel consumption of a diesel engine with that of a gasoline engine, as shown by the green lines for these specific example engines, we observe that the specific fuel consumption by the diesel engine is generally lower than that of the gasoline engine. And that's for two main reasons. First of all, the chemical power density in diesel fuel is higher than that of gasoline fuel. And second of all, the power efficiency of a diesel engine is generally better than the power efficiency of a gasoline engine. Moreover, we observe that the optimal operating point, mu star, so the point where the specific fuel consumption reaches a minimum, is generally lower for the diesel engine, typically 
around or below 2000 RPM and higher for the gasoline engine, typically between 3000 and 4000 RPM. Apart from power efficiency, another important performance criterion for automotive engine is the emission of carbon dioxide and also air pollutants such as nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide, commonly referred to as NOx, hydrocarbon and carbon oxide and so on. Then of course the weight, the size and the cost of the engine itself and the corresponding powertrain. And finally also the range, weight and speed of fueling or charging the energy storage of the vehicle. After the engine, let's also take a quick look at the brake systems of a vehicle. These brake systems in vehicles serve three main purposes, namely to decelerate the vehicle possibly to a stopping position, to prevent the acceleration on a downward slope and to keep the vehicle in a resting position, for example, while parking. To this end, the brakes deliver a braking torque to some or all of the wheels of the vehicle against their current direction of rotation. The main brake types of a vehicle, as distinguished by underlying physical principle, are the engine brake, friction brakes, and electromagnetic brakes. In the rest of this section, we'll take a little deeper look into each of these types of brakes. First, the engine brake refers to the braking torque that is produced by a gasoline or diesel engine when the accelerator pedal is released. It is caused, for one, by friction in the drivetrain and the engine itself to a minor extent and then mainly by air compression losses in the engine. So that makes up the majority of the braking effect. Clearly, the braking torque produced by the engine brake increases with the rotation speed of the engine. So shifting to a smaller gear will increase the braking torque of the engine brake. The main use of the engine brake is to prevent acceleration of the vehicle on a downward slope, so to maintain a constant speed. For passenger vehicles, the engine brake is actually sufficient to keep the vehicle at a constant speed on all customary road slopes. However, this is not true for heavy duty vehicles where the engine brake is not sufficient and an additional friction brake is needed to maintain a constant speed. The principle of friction brakes is to dissipate the kinetic energy of the vehicle by transforming it into heat. In fact, there are two main types of friction brakes in automobiles. The first one is a drum brake and the second one is a disc brake and both are represented schematically in these drawings. For the drum brake, a drum shown in white here is connected to the rotating wheel. If the brake is to be applied, the brake pressure is increased, pushing additional brake fluid into the wheel cylinder, causing the two pistons on each end of the cylinder to move outwards. This pushes the leading shoe and the trailing shoe against the rotating drum. Notice that the brake shoes have pivot points at the other side of the brake. In the contact areas between the brake shoes and the drum, the drums are covered with linings. When the brake is to be released, the brake pressure is reduced and a return spring pulls the two shoes here together so that there is no more contact between the linings and the drum and 
the brake fluid is forced back out of the cylinder and back into a reservoir. For the disc brake, a disc is connected to the rotating wheel, shown here from a sidewards perspective and frontal perspective. If the brake is to be applied, the brake pressure is increased, pushing additional brake fluid into the cylinder and thus pushing the piston against the disc. As a result of the reactive force of the piston pushing against the disc, the brake caliper with the other side of the brake is pulled to the right and essentially the brake contracts against both sides of the disc. In the actual friction area between the brake and the disc, there are brake pads installed which rest on so-called braking plates. If the brake is to be released, again the brake pressure is reduced, forcing the brake fluid back out of the cylinder and thus causing the two sides of the brake to move back apart and preventing further friction between the brake pad and the brake disc. Note that this is just a brief introduction into the two main brake types to give you a rough idea of what they look like. In reality, there exist additional types of drum brakes and of course, there are a lot more details about either type of brake. Further important elements of real friction brake systems include a method and device for brake force distribution between the four wheels, as illustrated by this a little simplistic diagram on the right hand side. The main idea is that if the driver pushes the brake pedal, then the pressure is increased in a master cylinder, and then this brake pressure has to be distributed between the four wheels of the vehicle. Modern brake systems in passenger vehicles also include a brake booster, which lowers the force that needs to be applied to the brake pedal in order to generate pressure in the brake system, or even an electric brake booster, which can be controlled electronically, and hence it's a prerequisite for electronic control of the brake and hence for any automated driving function. And last but not least, all kinds of safety mechanisms that of course play a major role for the brake. The main paradigm of automotive safety is redundancy. According to industrial standards, a safety concept has to be developed for the brake system of a vehicle. In this safety concept, all kinds of failure scenarios are analyzed. So for the brake in particular, there's an analysis of which parts of the brake could fail. And then for each of these failure scenarios, there's an alternative plan on how to stop the car. For example, most modern passenger vehicles contain an entirely dual hydraulic circuit for the scenario where the primary circuit fails due to a pressure loss, for instance, because of a leakage somewhere in the circuit. Very common until the 1980s, but less common today was the introduction of an emergency brake, which is an entirely redundant brake system that operates purely mechanically. Usually, this was the handbrake of the car. However, the drawback of this design option is quite obvious. Namely, if the main brake system should fail, it is likely that many drivers will not think about the option of using the handbrake, especially if they're under stress in an emergency situation. Generally speaking, it is a goal to keep the fallback solutions in case of a component failure as simple as possible. Especially, mechanical solutions are usually preferred 
over electronic components. That's why for passenger vehicles, there's usually not a dual brake booster installed, but in case of a failure of the main hydraulic system, the dual hydraulic circuit and hence the brake is operated purely mechanically by the driver and hence without the help of an electric component such as the brake booster. For some vehicles, such as heavy duty vehicles, however, the force exerted by the driver via the brake pedal might not be sufficient to actually stop the car. And in this case, it's also required to have a dual brake booster installed. Of course, this again should only give you a rough idea of the actual safety mechanisms that are in place for the brake system of a car. The details behind these are actually much more complicated and involved than what we could cover as part of this course. The last type of brakes that we will discuss in this video are electromagnetic brakes. They split into regenerative and non-regenerative brakes. First, about non-regenerative brakes. They come in the form of an eddy current brake that dissipates the kinetic energy of the vehicle as heat. However, unlike friction brakes, there is no physical contact between moving parts. This, of course, has the main advantage that abrasive wear is significantly reduced. Eddy current brakes are used mainly on train type of vehicles, so for instance also roller coasters. Second, for regenerative brakes, the main idea of regenerative brakes is to recover the kinetic energy of the vehicle as electric energy, so that it is not lost as heat, but it can be used again for instance to re-accelerate the vehicle. The main advantages are quite obvious. This will lead to an increase in energy efficiency of the vehicle and also a reduction of the wear out of the friction brake. Note that a regenerative brake cannot be used to entirely replace a friction brake. The main difficulty with the process of regenerative braking is that braking delivers a very high power over fairly short periods of time. Hence, special forms of energy storage are required. For example, 42 volt batteries, supercapacitors, flywheels that store the energy as kinetic energy in a rotating wheel, and compressed air storages where energy is stored in terms of pressure in a tank. There is still a lot of research and development going on about these forms of energy storage and also about what is the best form of storing energy for regenerative braking. Also, further research is needed about the extent of efficiency improvement that can be achieved by regenerative braking.